child sits in stillness looking out of a window and sees no future she feels her life slip away like sand welcome to a celebration of courage dedication and one man's pursuit of a world free of nuclear weapons tonight we gather not only to honor the memory of a champion of nuclear abolition, but also to rekindle the flames of hope and progress that he so passionately ignited. In a world often overshadowed by fear and division, David Krieger's unwavering commitment to peace serves as a beacon of light, guiding us towards a future defined not by the threat of annihilation, but by the promise of cooperation and understanding. My name is Anastasia Shahijanova. I'm the Government Development and Outreach Coordinator of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and I'm also an undergraduate senior at Columbia University studying sustainable development and political science. It is truly an honor to be with you here tonight. I would now like to share a snippet of David's perspective on nuclear weapons in his own words. This comes from the preface of his famed poetry collection, God's Tears. Those above the bombs, the victors, celebrated the technological achievement of their weapons. They went on to engage in a nuclear arms race based on mutually assured destruction. Those beneath the bombs, the victims, looked into the hellish inferno, the blast, fire, and red radiation created by the detonation of the bombs displayed in death and devastation. They learned a lesson far different than had the victors. Never again, we shall not repeat the evil. The vision of humanity's future held by those above the bombs and those beneath the bombs may prove to be the decisive struggle of our time. On the side of technological triumph is the arrogance of power that is willing to put at risk the future of civilization, if not of life itself. On the side of the survivors, the Hibakusha, is the moral clarity of calling evil by its name. Resolving this struggle between technological supremacy and moral clarity has not been easy. Technology has been a driving force in modern societies and has been imbued with an aura of prestige. Many people on the planet are confused about nuclear weapons and feel disempowered in attempting to confront their dangers. Many are also ignorant, apathetic, or in denial. Unfortunately, such orientations towards nuclear weapons are de facto votes for continuing, even escalating, the nuclear threat to humanity. Today, you will hear from many people who are close to David, family, friends, and colleagues, and they will speak of his strength of character and open-hearted personality. It is now my pleasure to introduce first the president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, Ivana Hughes. Ivana is a senior lecturer in chemistry at Columbia University and is a member of the scientific advisory group to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I want to thank Ivana sincerely for her caring, nurturing, and ambitious leadership. She has been an incredible mentor to me and so many other young people who wish to join this movement. I am looking forward to the future of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation under her leadership. Thank you for being with us today to celebrate the life and the legacy of a giant, Dr. David Malcolm Krieger. David was a man of peace and a nuclear abolitionist but he was also a man of Santa Barbara. I'm pleased that we're able to gather as a community in the beautiful Music Academy and to center the role that David played in bringing the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation to life and in sustaining it for over 40 years. In turn, the foundation played a huge role in his life and in establishing him 
as a voice of conscience in the nuclear age and a beloved figure both locally and internationally. I didn't know David for as long or as well as so many people in this audience. However, through the Nuclear Zero lawsuits, working with Lori Ashton and Lynn Sarko and their team at Keller Rohrbeck back in 2014, David inspired scientific investigations that my husband Evelyn and I conducted in the Marshall Islands with Columbia University students. Work that relates to NAPF's ongoing efforts to achieve nuclear justice for people and communities affected by nuclear weapons testing and use. Quite simply, I could not have a greater sense of privilege and responsibility in succeeding David in leading the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, both given the Foundation's rich history as well as the work that we're doing now towards the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. A vision that David held ever since he visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a graduate student in the 1960s. By the time I got to know David better through in-person and virtual meetings at NAPF, his health was already declining. He would quietly sit through a meeting and then, after hearing a lively and sometimes heated discussion about one topic or another, David would make a statement so deep and thoughtful and profound that we would all, at least for a moment, be speechless. He had a brilliant mind, an enormous heart, and a moral compass second to none. When I first met with David, Professor Richard Falk, our board chair Frank Bodnar, and others from the NAPF board, about taking a position with the Foundation. David smiled warmly as he spoke about my passion for nuclear abolition, my commitment to strengthening the international treaties that establish and guide nuclear weapons policies, including the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and my devotion to working with young people. I received lots of questions about my experience leading efforts at Columbia, what I would envision for the foundation and its future, how I would handle splitting my time between New York City and Santa Barbara. As I gave various answers, David kept giving me an approving smile that made me feel so comfortable and confident. And then he asked one question, the only question. How would you feel about asking people for money to support the Foundation's work? I answered that I would be honored to be in the position to do so. So today, in honor of David and what he would have done, <laughs> let me invite you to support our work, to join our events, and to spread the word about the insanity of nuclear weapons and the imperative of their elimination. We need your help. Let us not sit quietly and let us walk on this important path together. The stakes are simply too high. With David's passing, our commitment to work tirelessly to educate and advocate for a peaceful world one that is free of nuclear weapons, has only grown. We work at the United Nations to strengthen and implement the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I serve as a member of the Scientific Advisory Group to the Treaty, and Christian Chiobano, our Director of Policy and Advocacy, serves as a Treaty Advisor to the Republic of Kiribati. We also work on other relevant treaties and resolutions in General Assembly that advance the cause of nuclear disarmament and nuclear justice. We hold events, we meet with diplomats, write op-eds, we educate and engage young people through internships, interviews, lectures, our poetry contests, and our youth initiative, Reverse the Trend which gives the opportunity to youth from around the world to contribute to the cause of disarmament and to attend and present 
at international conferences, at the United Nations, and beyond. I'm pleased to share that in honor of David, 1622 Anna Kappa Street, the home of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, will from now on be named David Krieger House. I'm also pleased to share that the Foundation has established a David Krieger Summer Internship, which will be a paid internship for outstanding college students to work with the Foundation for a summer, contribute to the cause of nuclear disarmament, and learn about the functioning of nonprofit organizations. We're indebted to the Krieger and Sweeney families for their generous support of the David Krieger Summer Internship. We're also grateful to Soka Bukai International, Saga Foundation, Martin and Dorothy Hellman, Cheryl Tonchin, Jimmy and Diane Hara, Mary Becker, Jill and Ron Dexter, Guy Dyer, Mr. and Mrs. Daryl Thompson, Beverly Kieber, Lanny and Holly Sherwin, and Patagonia. I am indebted to all of you for being with us for this celebration. And I'm especially pleased that David's beloved wife, Carol Lee, and their beautiful children and grandchildren could be with us today. I have the warmest admiration and appreciation for all of our participants, our poets, Perry Wonga, Edwin Osborne, and Paul Willis, as well as Professor Richard Falk, who will deliver today's keynote, David's children, Mara Sweeney and Jonathan Krieger, David's brother, Gary Krieger, and friend, Cliff Garrison, all of whom will also deliver remarks. We're grateful to all of the participants for making this a very special program, the kind of program that I like to think David would have wanted. It's gonna be the hard part. Last year, I wrote my first poem since my schoolgirl days. <laughs> and promptly sent it to David and Perry Longo. David delighted in seeing me catch the poetry bug, even if just a little. Today I want to read to you a poem I wrote after David passed. I practiced so many times, and I, and I thought I got to the point where I didn't tear up. But so here it goes. The poem is entitled David Krieger. He left us too soon, but he laid a path. He may be gone, but he's still with us. We will not rest till his dream is reality. We owe it to him and to humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Next, I am glad to introduce Perry Longo. Perry was a Santa Barbara Poet Laureate from 2005 until 2009. Her latest poetry book is entitled Baggage Claim. She's a member of the Board of Directors of NAPF and Poetry Chair. She has taught poetry and lectured on the intersection of poetry and peace worldwide. As a psychotherapist, Perry facilitates poetry writing workshops for wellness. Perry, please. and a special um, hello and warm greeting to David's family. Some of you I've met a little bit, some not at all, and we're here to pay homage to a man we all dearly loved for lots of different reasons. Uh, David and I were good poetry buddies. Uh, we met in an adult ed poetry class back in 1970 or 71, and we were both 
very young, and little did I know that someday I'd be standing up here reading a poem by David Krieger at his memorial. Uh, those of you who know David well know he loved to write poems. Um, even I thank you so much for that poem you wrote for David. I think it touched all our hearts deeply. So, you know, around here you can't help but catch the poetry book. <laughs> I'm going to read a poem written by David himself. In December of 2014, um, David published many books of poetry, and this was always one of my favorites. A poem for the crossroads. I would like to write a poem and nail it to a stake at humanity's crossroads. It would say, choose your path wisely, it would say, this path we are on is far too treacherous, a trap for the unwary and complacent. It would say, take down the gun pointed at humanity's heart. Enough of war, enough of nuclear weapons, enough of stumbling to our collective suicide. It would say, enough homage to death. Choose life and be a kinder than necessary. It would certainly say, when it rains, the water sinks into the earth and the grass grows toward the sun. It would say, when the winds blow, the leaves will flutter from the trees like butterflies. It would remind us to stop and look at the beauty around us. It would say, this is Eden but it needs care. It would say, before you choose a path, think about the people of the future. It would say, make each moment of your time on earth matter. It would say, choose the path of peace. Thank you, David. Thank you, Perry. Next, I have the pleasure of welcoming Noel Paul Stuckey of the legendary folk group Peter, Paul, and Mary. He has been a lifelong activist for social justice, and we are so lucky to have him here with us. Noel will perform How Can I Keep From Singing? Noel? Thank you. <laughs> Our lives roll on. In endless song above Earth's lamentations, we hear the real, though far off hymn that hails the new creation. Above the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. I can I keep from singing when tyrants tremble sick with fear and hear their death bell ringing when friends rejoice both far and near how can I keep from singing no storm can shake this in most calm while to that rock I'm clinging Since love is Lord of heaven and earth How can I keep from singing? How can we keep from singing? And that was supposed to be the only song I sang today. <laughs> but I got to thinking about David and how he would like us all to sing. Yeah. And since you don't know the words to that song, I thought I'd sing a song that I'm sure you know. <laughs> it was made famous so long ago. Here it comes. 
Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing again. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls have picked everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? And where have all the young girls gone? Long time passing, I say, where have all the young girls gone? Long time ago, where have all the young girls gone? Gone the young men, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they? Where have all the young men gone? Long time ago. And where have all the young men gone? Gone for soldiers, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? And where have all the soldiers gone? Long time passing, where have all the soldiers gone? Long time ago, where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyards, gone to graveyards, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever and where have all the green cards gone? Long time passing, excuse me. Where have all the green cards gone? Long time ago. Where have all the green cards gone? Gone to flowers everyone. When will they ever? When will they ever learn? Now the last verse for you. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls have picked them everyone. When will they ever learn? When will we ever learn? Professor Richard Falk. Professor Falk is the Albert Milbank Emeritus Professor of International Law at Princeton University and board member of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Richard, your books have been instrumental in my own studies, and I want to sincerely thank you for your lifetime commitment to truth, justice, and peace. You've demonstrated the importance of intertwining a meaningful intellectual existence with an engaged life and active citizenship. Thank you so much.
I want to begin by adding my greetings to those many members of David's family that are here among us on this most special occasion. At once solemn in our remembrance of such a great loss, and at the same time celebratory in our sense of David's lifetime dedication to what Lincoln called our better angels. And a warm welcome to those others who have gathered here in friendship and admiration for a Richard, life so the, well lived. Richard, move and the mic in front of your voice more. Uh, too close to it or too far? Closer to far away. Too, too close? Yeah, Closer. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. Rock star, rock star stuff. <laughs> I feel moved and challenged to be part of this remembrance of David, coming a few days after the question of nuclear weapons was brought before the American people by the many honors bestowed uh, on Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer at the Academy Awards ceremony. I believe it accurate to suggest that not since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1961, or perhaps even the atomic attacks on Japanese cities at the end of World War II, has there been such attention given to the dangers of nuclear war abetted by the existential threats posed by uh, Vladimir Putin's reminder to the West that Russia is ready for nuclear war if the U.S. dares uh, escalate its involvement in Ukraine by putting U.S. troops on the ground. The loss of David in 2023, in the setting of such vivid background circumstances, reminds us of his lifelong dedication to ridding humanity of the nuclear menace, both by educating Americans and others about the apocalyptic dangers of nuclear war, and by his sharp criticisms of the distressing embrace of nuclear weapons by the U.S. and other allied governments. This embrace included the bipartisan failure to comply with international law, most explicitly with Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, requiring nuclear weapons states to seek in good faith nuclear disarmament. In a more personal sense, David left us at a time when I know that he felt that his successor as president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation would provide the same energy and inspiration embodied in the practical leadership that defined both his professional and spiritual identity. I know that I speak for the entire board and staff of the NAPF when I say that we all share David's sense that the Foundation is in the best possible hands under this leadership provided by Ivana Hughes. We could not be more fortunate having, than having Ivana as David's successor. Which I'm glad to report was a view that David fully shared. My own special friendship with David, stretching over a period of more than four decades, combine three dimensions that, are, that I have experienced with no other person on this 
or any other planet. <laughs> First, an abiding love of poetry as a source of deep knowledge, of truth, of goodness and beauty, as stretching our sense of reality beyond what is expressible in ordinary language, and also as the most challenging of spiritual practices. Secondly, our shared love of tennis, as an exalting and satisfying, if at times frustrating, <laughs> uh, blend of sport and fellowships. And thirdly, our sense of horror and fear with respect to all that was associated with the past, present, and future of nuclear weaponry, giving rise in David to a resolve not to be a passive observer in this wrong turn taken by the human species, but to embark on a lifelong commitment to do everything within his power to work toward the abolition of this infernal weaponry, not mainly to avoid himself experiencing such a human tragedy, but more so for the sake of those he loved and future generations and humanity as a whole. We also talk quite often of nurturing a fourth dimension of our friendship, that is, our fondness for the game of chess, but we never have found uh, the time or the situation that allowed us to uh, test our relative abilities. Probably, fortunately for me. Uh, another aspect of this friendship was the closeness of our friend, our two families, as more broadly shared with Imogen and Jerry Spence, which was reinforced by the closeness of my wife, Hello, and by Carol Lee and Mara, David's ever so loving and faithful partner and his beloved daughter. I know that others more qualified than I have read and will be reading some of David's poems, but I wanted to frame my remarks by a poem that expresses with devastating brevity the morbid hypocrisy of those standing guard over our arsenal of nuclear weapons and continuing to this day to do so with a smile of national self-righteousness and condescension, condescension for those who oppose nuclearism in all its manifestations. The title of the poem is A Short History, A Short History Lesson, 1945. August 6th, dropped atomic bomb on civilians at Hiroshima. August 8th, agreed to war crimes trials for Nazis. August 9th, dropped atomic bomb on civilians at Nagasaki. This is an instruct, it is an instructive irony that David's death occurred in the same year as Oppenheimer's film was released and created this renewal of concern about the danger of nuclear war and was further uh, accentuated by Putin's threats or warnings that art is often the precursor of history rather than its sequel. I've had the odd personal experience of knowing both David as a cherished friend and Robert Oppenheimer as a somewhat irksome acquaintance. <laughs> I found an 
unusual mixture of convergence and divergence in my experience of these two extraordinary men. Both of their lives were publicly defined by the Bible. Oppenheimer, by its development and later as a witch, uh, witch hunting uh, reaction to his moral sensitivity. David, by the use of the bomb, his anti-nuclear activism and civil society leadership in advocating abolition. Oppenheimer never wanted to altogether relinquish uh, the fame he acquired by being known as the father of the A-bomb, or for that matter, his access to top secret classified government documents. David had no ambivalence about his opposition to the use of atomic bombs against innocent civilian populations in Japan. At the end of World War II, when diplomacy could almost certainly have achieved Japan's surrender. While Oppenheimer took satisfaction in the success of his mission, including the use of the weapon, although he feared and opposed its further development, which gave him, which got him into unpleasant trouble with the militarist and foreign policy establishment, whose eyes were firmly fixed after 1945 on geopolitical supremacy for the United States and the West, and not peace for the world. In a sense, Oppenheimer's life is a metaphor for the red lines of working within the structure of government for a more peaceful world. While David's life is filled with the benefits of moral purity, but tormented by the frustrations of mere citizenship in a country that would not act in accord with its proclaimed values. Both lives will be forever intimately connected with the realities of the nuclear age. By their shared opposition to the persistence of nuclearism and by their divergent paths of rejection from within and frustrations from without the established political order. I am sure Ivana will find creative ways of keeping alive this dual pedagogical legacy of both David and Oppenheimer as continuing exemplary figures in this ongoing struggle to avoid a future war fought with nuclear weapons. Again, personally, it was my privilege to have learned from these two iconic figures. Let me end these remarks by a poem written by David in 2020. This one expressive of his rare comprehension among we Westerners of right living, right feeling, and right knowing. David's words, wisdom is available to all, but rare distilled from experience, advanced by dialogue, listening carefully, thinking deeply, doing what is right, selecting good over evil, speaking truth, acting with integrity, living simply, being kind and compassionate, demonstrating courage, learning from nature, questioning, following the way, Tao, helping others, striving for peace with justice, 
being humble, choosing hope, persevering. Thank you.
I fold a sky blue crane. When hung with the others, the new bird disappears against the sky. May one girl ask for two miracles? Miracle one, Sadako wins the race. Miracle two, no more bombs, no more crying mothers. My mother sits on my bed and helps me count the birds. David's younger brother, who lives in Florida with his wife. Gary? Hi, good afternoon. Lots of you know David from all kinds of exceptional experiences as an adult. I'd like to share a little bit about Dave from our early days. I was born, Dave was five. He was my first role model. It was just the two of us as siblings, my mom, dad, and Dave and I. I have an old paper uh, matchbook with a photograph on the cover. I don't know if a lot of you remember those. Uh, it's a great picture. Dave in full cowboy regalia at about five and a half years old, holding me tightly in his arms at about six months old. He's smiling with the biggest smile ever and looking like, what a great brother, you know? Until, he abruptly stands up and dumps me on my head for the family more. <laughs> Brothers. I remember our first real family vacation. I was five, Dave was about ten. We went to Honolulu. At that time, we stayed at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And if you can believe it, it was the only hotel on the entire Waikiki Beach. Beautiful. I remember Dave in a Hawaiian skirt, you know, a grass skirt, a lay around his neck, dancing the hula with all of the uh, employees from the hotel leading the guests in, in a fun experience. The next day I remember him learning how to surf and being on the surfboard out in the, in the ocean. Uh, I think that's really when Dave found his love for Hawaii. He was always a popular guy. He, uh, he was a, a football star, he was charismatic, he was intelligent, great scholar, um, and uh, he was always the big man on campus. After his first year in college, he went to Mexico for a summer. Now most people come home with presents and gifts. Dave did too, but not what you might expect. He brought me a coconut. Not an ordinary coconut. It was carved in the face of, a, of Fidel Castro. <laughs> and he brought a monkey home. Not a stuffed monkey, not a carved coconut monkey, a real live monkey. <laughs> I was really excited at 15, I think, at that time. I wanted a monkey at home, and my parents said, uh -huh. <laughs> Well, the monkey went off to Occidental with him, and everything was great until the guys got tired of him at the fraternity house. So what did Dave do? He talked to one of his professors and coaxed him into allowing Dave to leave the monkey in his cage 
in the guy's research laboratory. Now, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Everything was great until one night, the monkey, who actually he named Ike, um, decided he knew how to open his cage. He did. He escaped into the lab and destroyed years of experience. Research gone. Well, I've never graduated, and I'm not sure Dave ever passed that class either. <laughs> Remember Dave at 10 falling in love with Hawaii? Well, he returned to Hawaii for grad school, um, and that's when he met the beautiful Carol Lee Gamble and fell in love all over again with Hawaii and all people Hawaiian. My last visit with Dave was a bittersweet, wonderful day. We had FaceTimed two, two days earlier, uh, and when I saw him on the camera, in my heart and my soul, I knew the end was near. I wanted to come out and see him, so I jumped on a plane the morning after and flew out to California. Um, I picked up my son Jeremiah and we drove up and spent a long half day with Dave and Carol Lee, with Mara and Abby and Alice. You know what, um, we were really close these last years and um, I had to see him. I wanted Dave to know I was there and I loved him. It was an amazing, special day. Three generations of us sitting around, talking, respecting, honoring, and loving a man who had been in our lives, actually all of our lives. A man who was dedicated to love, to family, and to peace. Well, the afternoon they out, and we gazed into each other's eyes, knowing it would be for the very last time. I feel like we locked eyes for an eternity. I cried, I wish him peace. I wish him an easy transition in the exchange I love you. It's the most painful goodbye I've ever experienced. Still my role model, Dave showed us what it was like to end life with grace and dignity and peace and love. I flew back and uh, three days later I was out sitting on the deck, looking at some beautiful clouds up in the sky, big, big clouds, puffy white clouds, that were blowing apart into little wisps and strands and floating off into the beautiful blue sky. My thoughts went to Dave, and as it turned out, at that very time, Dave was breaking apart into little pieces and transitioning out of his body. The universe is filled with great synchronicity. Thank you all for being here to share in the celebration of his life. And I know you'll join me in celebrating him and holding his memory close to your heart. And I think all that's left to say now is aloha. <laughs> Thank you.
you so much. That was so beautiful. Next, we will hear from the musical duo Sandy Jones and Hal Maynard. Sandy was a longtime director of communications at NAPF, and both Sandy and Hal were close friends of David's. They will sing their own original song, dedicated to David, entitled Life is in the Heart, Swept Away. No, you still sing like an angel. We just miss that sweet finger style guitar you play. Especially as guitar players. And thank you, Anastasia. And thank you, Gary, for those stories. That was so that was amazing. Uh, I wrote a song about David's journey in life. Uh, it's called Life's in the Heart. Swept away. Years ago, in Hiroshima, where that bombs that stole found himself beneath the shadow, where he had a change of soul. Peace 
foundation and the uh, Krieger and Sweeney families. It's a real privilege to take part with you today. When my wife Sharon and I were raising our kids in the 80s and 90s, we had a jigsaw puzzle of the United States that we sometimes worked on with them. And this puzzle was left over from one of our own families when we ourselves were growing up in the 50s and 60s. Like many puzzles and placemats of that era, it had perky little illustrations of local features spread across the map. So Mount Rushmore, Golden Gate Bridge, Statue of Liberty, those sorts of things. So this is the kind of map I want you to picture as you hear this poem, Puzzle of America. And as you listen, I also want you to imagine David Krieger as the speaker of the poem. And Perhaps one of his children or grandchildren back in the day as the one he is speaking to. And by extension, of course, he would also be speaking to us as he still does. Puzzle of America. There are 100 pieces of our puzzle of America. Alaska is on the bottom. Four clocks across the top. A big bald eagle stands upon the Gulf of Mexico. In Georgia, they grow coffee cups and peanuts for a crop. There are 100 pieces to our puzzle of America, unless one falls unnoticed to the floor, which can leave a great gap in the coast of California, as if the latest earthquake had redesigned the shore. <laughs> There are nine brown cows in our puzzle of America, from Texas to Montana. You counted them yourself. Two ladies in red bathing suits in Phoenix and in Florida. A skier up in Idaho, tiny as an elf. A salmon from the sea in our puzzle of America is gladly leaping inland just about to take a bite of the little black dot that is Portland, Oregon where everyone's asleep, for it's one o'clock at night. Just right of Carson City, in our puzzle of America, a nuclear explosion is flowering from the soil, so slender, pink, and pretty that you thought it was a cherry tree. I cannot tell a lie, but I didn't want to spoil your thoughts just now about our puzzle of America. But when you reach a right half-life of nine or ten, you might start to wonder what that pretty pink cherry tree will do to the apple up in Washington. And all those cows in our puzzle of America, the salmon and the eagle, what will become of them? The ladies in red bathing suits in Phoenix and in Florida, the skier elf in Idaho, what will become of them? We're looking for the pieces of our puzzle of America. A few years back, I thought we had them all. If you find them, let me know, for I've searched about everywhere, the bedroom and the bathroom and the kitchen and the hall, all the places that the pieces of our puzzle of America could fall out of the box are the places I try. It's your turn to look. Because I'm going to go to sleep now. I had my turn when the whole world cried. I had my turn when the whole world cried. Wow. Thank you. We will now hear from one of David's two sons, Jonathan Krieger. Jonathan lives in Virginia with his wife, Kristen, and their three kids. Thank you, Paul, for that moving poem. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jonathan Krieger. 
Today we gather not to mourn a loss, but to celebrate the extraordinary legacy of my father, David Malcolm Krieger. He created many peace warriors, myself included. Today, we have heard about my father from his colleagues, friends, and brother. I would like to share the legacy he left to me. We don't get to choose our father, but I am immensely proud of mine. He was a warrior for peace, an innovative poet, a teacher, a loving son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, and friend. He accom his accomplishments included JD, PhD, fluent in English, Spanish, and Japanese, quarterback for the Occidental Tigers, fifth-degree black belt in Shito Ryu Karate, co-founder and president emeritus of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Growing up with him was quite interesting. Our meals at the dining room table included conversations that were often light and funny. We played catch with the football in the yard, and I learned to run a down and out. <laughs> he helped me with my homework and taught me karate. As an adult, we played numerous games of tennis. Though he won 99.9% .9 of them, I would give anything for one more. We watched a thousand beautiful sunsets and played cribbage on the back deck in Napopo. It was an honor to be his son, and I would always choose him to be my father. <clears throat> he will forever be in my heart. So, as we honor my father, let us carry his legacy forward. Let us strive to live our lives with the same passion, love, and zest for life that he exemplified. Let us honor his memory by being the best versions of ourselves and by spreading peace wherever we go. told me that as a young man, he visited my hometown, Hiroshima, and this had a great impact on him. In fact, it was such a decisive experience that he decided to dedicate his life to the abolition of nuclear weapons. I am grateful that David joined us, Hibakusha survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who are convinced that no human being should ever have to experience such inhumanity, immorality, and illegality of the atomic bombing. It is almost 80 years since those atrocities. And yet, this is the reality of nuclear age. While our blood boils, people like David never lost faith to their vision for a more just, safe, peaceful, cleaner, greener world. David kept on changing the world with his hope for humanity. In closing, I would like to express my, condol my deepest condolence to all 
who have loved and supported David in life, especially his wife, Kao Lee, his children and grandchildren. And in his death, let us continue to support and to be in community with those who will keep David's torch raised high to illuminate a path to greater compassion and humanity, a path to zero. Thank you, David, for your exemplary life for us to emulate. I'm Doug Roach in Canada. And um, for many years, I worked closely with David Krieger when I chaired the Middle Powers Initiative. This was a grouping of civil society organizations which sought to energize non-nuclear weapon states to put pressure on the nuclear weapon states to reduce their nuclear arsenals and move toward comprehensive negotiations. The Nuclear Age Peace Foundation played a major role in this endeavor. And in fact, nuclear disarmament had no more enduring advocate than David Krieger. David was soft-spoken, yet he had a backbone of steel. He was modest about his achievements, yet his work spoke loudly. He was gentle of spirit, yet passionate about the abolition of nuclear weapons. I had the honor of being a guest in his house in Santa Barbara on a couple of occasions, and the hospitality I received from David and Carol Lee was heartwarming. David spoke lovingly about his family, and I saw the full measure of a man. In 2005, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award, which I cherish today. So in my own way, I would like today to rededicate that award to David himself, who was my inspiration for the long road that we walked together toward the abolition of nuclear weapons. The goal is still far off, but when we get there, David Krieger will share our common joy. Hi, my name is Mark Kilberger, and I'm a former board member of NAPF, and my brother Craig received a Wage Peace Award. wanted to express our condolences, of course, to Carol Lee and to the entire Krieger family, and just say thank you for allowing us and the world to share David. Um, David was such a remarkable friend, mentor to so many people, and uh, had a big, profound impact on my life and the life of my family. David was a statesman, a man of peace, a scholar, a poet a father, and just a remarkable, kind, considerate human being. And we think of humanity and, and the concept of what David stood for. Um, it's just amazing to see the impact he's had on the world and the impact of so many people's lives. He was always waging peace, but he was also waging compassion. He was waging love. He was waging understanding. He was waging the understanding of bringing people together and the fact that the world can be a different place. It's that spirit and that passion that stays with all of us today. So we just wanted to say thank you for having David share to the team at the foundation. Thank you for keeping on this incredibly important work that David started with so many others in support, but it really was David's passion that brought this project to life. And we just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to share these words with you here today as well. Best wishes.
Dr. Helen Caldicott. I'm honoured to talk about the life of David Krieger. I think I've never met anybody so dedicated to the cause of peace as was dear David. He, he used every minute of every day on this. He also wrote wonderful poems and he was highly intelligent. He set up his organisation. He involved extremely intelligent and dedicated people in his cause for peace. He had a remarkable effect upon others, including myself, and I honour David. It's so sad that he died the way he did. He didn't deserve that. His lovely wife and his children, I'm sure, are so sad to lose him, as am I. He's left a big gap and vacuum in the world. So, David, I absolutely honour you for the work that you have done. Bye-bye. We're here today to honor the memory of David Krieger, a tireless worker for peace in the nuclear age. David was very wise in establishing and then running the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation from 1982 to 2019. NAPF is unusual in combining combating the nuclear threat and building a more peaceful world. In fact, viewed from that angle, the nuclear threat becomes the nuclear opportunity. In the nuclear age, Building a peaceful world is no longer just morally desirable. It's essential for human survival. Thank you, David, for your efforts to alert society to that truth. While there is still time, while we still can, wake up. We here gathered have experienced a very great honor. Knowing David Krieger, a man of love and kindness, courage and humility, a man rooted in goodness, and beauty and truth. Like a kind and gentle man of peace before him, he saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw atomic war and tried to stop it. Let us therefore tonight in solidarity and in friendship, resolve to continue our journey together to nuclear zero and to the world peace that lies beyond. I will close now, not with my words, but with his. These were the very last words he spoke to me in barely a whisper, never give up.
Ducks are nuts, it's a, a crazy thing. Just like squirrels waiting for the spring. We hide them underground, preparing for a day when some crazy squirrel try to blow us all away. I say, Ducks are nuts. Ducks are nuts. No ifs, no ends, no buts, you know. Nukes are nuts. Na 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 na. It's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, one nuke for another, but if that's the truth, be the end of the world for the human race. No trees, no squirrels, no trace, I say, nukes are nuts, you can say it too, nukes are nuts, no ifs, no ifs, no ends, no buts, you know. So nuts. Now you may think this is a kind of a cheeky way to deal with a pretty heavy problem. Well, I did too. I mean, I got this request from an organization in Santa Barbara and they said, would you make a 20 second uh, video, maybe 30 second video and include the phrase nukes are nuts in it? And I went, you gotta be kidding. Nukes are nuts. But I went on their website to see who else had done it. And there was Desmond Tutu. And I said, no, he's not really. And for the first 20 seconds of his little video, he spoke about the craziness of the money that's invested in these antiquated, I'll get you if you get me, weapons. And at the very end of it, he says, nukes are nuts. <laughs> I figured if he could do it, I could at least compose a song and... And if you need a justification for singing the chorus, that's, here's your excuse tonight. There's India and Pakistan, at least seven more countries where these nuclear weapons are stored. 17,000 warheads, it's true, totally secure, except for five of the outside. <laughs> Somebody said the system's too big to fail Last time I heard that, somebody went to jail A push of a button in defense of a nation And I hope it wasn't a miscommunication Dukes are nuts, come on now Dukes are nuts, no ifs No ifs, no ends, no buts to say Nukes are nuts, na 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 Asking us to make peaceful choices Every woman, every man, hey Even squirrels can understand that Nukes are nuts, come on now Nukes are nuts No gifts, no wins, no buts say Nukes are nuts Yeah, thank you Na, 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 na. Yeah, nukes are nuts in the world Getting smaller, tempers getting shorter, and walls are getting taller. We got to come up with the master plan. And what we can't do, hey, maybe love can I see. Nukes are nuts, come on now. Nukes are nuts. No kids, no wins, no buts. Nukes are one more time on nuts. Nukes are nuts. No whips, no wins, no buts.
Cliff and David met shortly after David arrived in Santa Barbara in the early 1970s, and they stayed close all these years. Would you all join me in a round of applause for our professional master of ceremonies? So I think we have a new song that's going to be number one on the hit parade with the uh, old Paul Stuckey's version there. That was, that was wonderful. It's amazing, you know, as, as I'm near the end of the program here, I kind of feel like the guy in the, you know, being interviewed for the job. And uh, when you're the last one, or nearly the last one on the interview schedule, you try and figure out something different to say, uh, so you can maybe get a good chance of getting that job. But um, it's amazing how we all kind of are on the same wavelength uh, tonight, uh, Professor Falk, and uh, everybody, uh, Ivana. Uh, we all love David so much. So uh, once again, I'm Cliff Pearson. I feel honored and grateful to be here amidst so many talented and intelligent people and speakers. I've been a friend of David's and the Krieger family for 50 years now. Uh, part of that time, I had the pleasure of being both Jeff and Jonathan's elementary school teacher. So that's been pretty good. I won't tell you about their hijinks now, but <laughs> see me at the reception. Uh, although, uh, although we're here uh, to remember David um, and his wonderful professional career, I wanted to help celebrate his life and speak about him and sort of shine a light on his personal background. Although most of you probably knew David as a serious intellectual sort of fellow, he certainly did have a very playful sense of humor. Many of you might remember his one-word poems. Did you know he had one-word poems? That were collected in an amusing anthology of sorts where each single word poem was followed by a long paragraph of review by a fictitious intellectual critic. <laughs> and this critic would find the deeper meanings and the literary references of each solo poetic piece. Of course, in these parodies, uh, David himself was both the poet and the esteemed critic. Another example of David's sense of humor was on display when, after hosting the Dalai Lama for a couple of days back in the 90s, around the time of the annual NAPF Dinner for Peace, I teased Dave and I said, so now that you've become familiar with the Dalai Lama, on a daily basis, how do you address him? Do you call him Dal or Mr. Lama? <laughs> no, David replied, I just call him Your Excellency, just as I asked Carolee to do for me. <laughs> <laughs> I first met the Kriegers uh, when their oldest son, Jeff, was in my fifth grade class at the Montecito Union School. I remember how excited I was as a new teacher to be invited to the Krieger home for the first time. Not only because David and Carol Lee were such charming and welcoming people, but also because their home and their garden are sort of like a slice of Hawaii. If you've been there, you know what I mean. And even now, I clearly remember that they played Cat Stevens' popular song, Peace Train, on the stereo that night. Peace train sounding louder, glide on the peace train. Very sorry, good. Noel, sorry. <laughs> Your record came second that night. And so began our friendship. In the 70s and 80s, and even up to the present time, the Krieger's family would gather at Thanksgiving and don their Hawaiian shirts for the annual family Christmas card photo. Since I had an interest in photography, I was often elected to be cameraman for them. Do you remember that? At first, the annual family photo greeting card was a normal, you know, four by six inch size. But as the years went on, it gradually became longer and wider and became a panoramic shaped card eventually in order to fit all the new spouses who joined the family, then the grandkids, 
and even a great-grandchild. With everyone still usually dressed in their Hawaiian shirts, even the family members that Carol Lee had to Photoshop in. <laughs> because as the Ohana, her family grew larger, they moved out across the country. Now David and I played a lot of tennis together. We actually played with Professor Falk and his wife too, quite often. And he and I even took home a couple of uh, trophies from member guest doubles tournaments at the Knollwood Tennis Club. He'd often call me up on a Friday afternoon and say, hey Cliff, how about hitting some balls up at the club? On a day like this, you know, those were fun times. He was a terrific athlete, as Jonathan and Gary pointed out. He was a star football quarterback when he was in high school and also played QB at Occidental College. He always loved watching pro football and he hosted several Super Bowl parties up at the house that I was lucky to attend. He earned his black belt in karate while living in Japan and continued teaching karate here in Santa Barbara for over 10 years. He was known as the Sensei of Montecito. <laughs> he and I also did a lot of walking and hiking together over the decades, including a very memorable week-long backpacking trip to the High Sierra back in the 70s with son Jeff and some other teenagers. We traversed many trails and roads all over the Santa Barbara area. I was one to try and get him out a bit, especially you know, as the pandemic hit. Uh, and it was rough for him as time went on because his Parkinson's made him tire more easily with the more vigorous sports and exercise. So we turned to walking. David, as you know, was always intellectually curious. He studied political science and worked to attain his PhD in international relations. He was an assistant professor at both University of Hawaii and San Francisco State University. He became further interested in studying the law, went to law school, and got his law degree. He studied for and passed a test to become a real estate broker. He became an author and an editor of more than 20 volumes about peace studies, nuclear disarmament, and the horrific consequences of war. And as we all know, he loved to read and write poetry, and in particular, he enjoyed haiku. But his passion continued to be the study of international law, disarmament, and the dangers of nuclear weapons. He came up with this crazy idea that he and his like-minded colleagues could develop a grassroots organization to change the world. Huh. Well, they succeeded. He had a vision of a peaceful planet where the threat of nuclear devastation could be forever eliminated. And he figured out so many ways to teach us all about these things. Uh, as Ivana pointed out, so many areas of, of uh, effort in the education area. Uh, internships, concerts, art shows, speakers from around the world, as well as David's own writings and, and anthologies. And in these ways, he brought us all up to a higher level of thinking and awareness. And for that, I thank him. At Japan's Peace University, David Krieger was treated like a famous celebrity. He established coalitions with many other anti nuke groups around the world, such as ICANN. He helped form the International Network of Engineers and Scientists and created a foundation presence at the United Nations in New York. He himself and the NAPF were nominated several times for the Nobel Peace Prize. I felt honored to know a nominee for that prize. I particularly enjoyed going to the annual Sadako Peace Day, where we heard music and poetry, as you know. This was held every August under the shady oaks and eucalyptus trees at the La Casa de Maria Retreat Center in the special Sadako Peace Garden. There we all found time for reflection, gentle music, meditation, the appreciation of poetry, and precious life itself. Over the years, uh, the NAPF sponsored the annual Dinner for Peace with Peace Leadership Awards and more. And these were so important. 
Just think how David and the foundation enriched all of our intellectual and spiritual lives. Right here in Santa Barbara, with the amazing people that they brought to our little town. Where else could we have been able to meet and speak with international luminaries such as Desmond Tutu, Jacques Cousteau, the Dalai Lama, Daniel Ellsberg, Beatrice Finney, Walter Cronkite, Carl Sagan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Helen Caldecott, and the list goes on. This was a true blessing in our lives. Now last June, I had the pleasure of traveling to Florence, Italy, where I was able to visit the well-known Galleria Academia. There I experienced and admired Michelangelo's incredible marble statue, the David. It is magnificent. It's about three times life size. Yet the details of his body, the muscles and the veins of his powerful arms and legs as carved by Michelangelo, they're all remarkably fashioned and amazing to behold. Similar to that historical David of the Old Testament, our David also faced a giant, powerful opponent with only his simple weapons, his voice, his passion, and his pen. Now this is a true fact. If you look closely at the sculpture's eyes, you'd be surprised to see that Michelangelo carved the young warrior's pupils in the shape of hearts. It's true. And so it was also that our David battled for his goals through eyes of love. Love for his family, his friends, and really for all of humankind. And our final remarks tonight will come from Mara Sweeney. She's David's daughter and a board-certified internist. Mara lives with her husband and three children here in Santa Barbara and serves on the board of NAPIA, helping us continue her father's life. On behalf of my mom, shoot. <laughs> On behalf of my mom and my family, as well as the board of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, I want to once again thank everyone for coming today. <laughs> for coming today to celebrate my dad's legacy. You've heard of his intelligence, dedication, passion, and commitments. You've heard that he lived a remarkable life. You're aware that founding the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation was his proudest accomplishment. You know that what he wanted most was for as many people as possible to be aware of the dangers of the nuclear age and to support him and join him in working toward the abolition of these weapons of mass destruction. I'm thrilled to see so many people here today because it is a sign of his good work. It is a sign to me that he reached you and inspired you to continue and carry on what he started. This is his greatest hope. You, are, you might remember my dad for his work, but we also hope that you'll remember him for any number of small kindnesses and the joy he brought. <clears throat> oh. 
my dad gave me a really good piece of advice some years ago. My work was hard. I was discouraged by something in the news. I was just feeling really helpless. And he said to me, find joy every day. That was his secret to getting through the hard days. Find joy. I know some of the things that gave him joy. Sunflowers, watching hummingbirds, writing poetry, holding hands with my mom, raking the pebbles in his front walk, <laughs> playing tennis at Knollwood, watching his children play sports, grandchildren play sports, excuse me, watching his grandchildren. <laughs> Cribbage on the deck at Napopo, and eating ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> Shortly before my dad passed, he asked me to tell him, what will make me think of him after he's gone? And I realized that what will make me think of him are those things that gave him joy. And I hope that is how you will remember him as well. Not just as a warrior for peace, but as a joyful man. And if you're looking for joy and are at a loss one morning, I think my dad might recommend ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and remembering my dad with me. so, so much, Mara, and everyone who spoke today. I never met David in person, but from everything that I heard today, it feels like I got a small glimpse into his extraordinary life, so thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us today, and for all of our program participants, for the absolutely incredible poetry, music, and remarks. David is missed but he will continue to guide our efforts in advancing a better, more just world. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in honoring and celebrating David in the past, while also helping to shape the future of a peaceful, more just world, one that is free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Please join us in the Maryland Horn House to your left for a catered reception. If you are able to support our work, you may scan the QR code that will appear on the screen and find us on our website at wagingpeace.org. Thank you so much. Where the sorrow never ends With stories sad and painful And a heart that bore no blame In the shadow 
of a bomb long dropped, the wounds of war remain. Ah.